Program Executive Officer Land Systems is the only program executive office in the Marine Corps and is located aboard Marine Corps Base Quantico. POLS is a Department of the Navy assigned senior executive tasked directly by ASNRDA with providing direct executive oversight to the Marine Corps' largest ground programs. The greater POLS team is comprised of Marines and civilians dedicated to developing, delivering, and sustaining lethal capabilities for our Marines. As the Marine Corps undertakes its greatest modernization in, in a generation, the PEO is playing a critical role in fielding modern cutting-edge technologies for our Marines. With several program managers fielding, managing, and sustaining a variety of systems to include the amphibious combat vehicle, a revolutionary radar system called Gator, the Common Aviation Command and Control Systems, the Marine Air Defense Integrated Systems, as well as the current LAV and its future replacement. Overall, the portfolio includes major defense acquisition programs and associated programs with an estimated value of $7.5 billion across the future year's defense programs. The PEO recently retired and currently managing the portfolio is the acting PEO, Mr. Rob Cross. Rob, thanks so much for taking the time and joining us today. Uh, before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you ended up here within our acquisition family? Sure, great. Uh, thanks for getting to do this, I guess. Uh, yeah, so I, after graduating uh, with a mechanical engineering degree from the University of Virginia, uh, I was hired into the Topside Composites Group at uh, the Naval Surface Warfare uh, Center Carter Rock Division. Uh, and I worked there for eight years, uh, you know, obviously on, on a variety of composite uh, projects and programs. Um, it kind of culminated when I was the lead engineer on the advanced and closed mast and sensor system on the LPD-17. So those two octagonal things sticking on the back of the on the LPD-17, I got to design those. I was kind of a kind of a highlight, good way to go out uh, there. And from from that position, I was hired directly into uh, PM AAA, where I was initially the hull uh, hull lead for the what then was the advanced amphibious assault vehicle. So it, it's kind of interesting because you were already working with the Gator Navy and you transitioned and put your arms around the Gator Marine Corps that was uh, eventually designed to go on that LPD-17. I appreciate that. Uh, how long have you been uh, with the uh, Marine Corps on, on this side of the house? Yeah, so, so I came to uh, September of 99. Okay. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's it's um, it's been a couple of years, years now. A yeah. couple of years, a couple of years. Yeah. We'll, we'll leave it off at that. Uh, so first off, I want to dive right into uh, and ask the question, why a PEO? And, and what's the difference between, you know, a PEO and, and what we do here at Marine Corps Systems Command? Yeah, um, yeah it's kind of an interesting question because I think, uh, you know, anywhere else in the, in the DOD acquisition enterprise, um, you know, that would be kind of a confusing question because uh, typically syscoms and POs have different roles. Right. Uh, you know, the PEO is really where, uh, at least in the Navy, certainly Air Force and Army, that's where the program management happens, and the syscom is really all of the supporting activity uh, to include certainly the people, the processes, uh, you know, the the tech authority, the contracting authority, um, fiscal authority, all all the sort of supporting elements of acquisition come from a syscom. So you know that's kind of the normal way. Certainly here in the Marine Corps, we always like to be a little bit different. Uh, so Syscom obviously manages a, a large number of programs right, right. Uh, under the PFMs uh, and, of course, the DERPM. Um, so it's a little bit different. So within the within the program management side, uh, there's nothing particularly different that the PO does than, than the Syscom programs do from a cost schedule performance. Right. Um, there are obviously there are some statutory requirements with respect to the ACAB ones. Uh, they do the MDAPs need to are required to be managed under a PO. All that came out of the old uh, Goldwater's Nichols Act and the right, right. and the NDA of ninety nine. Um, so that's kind of the the statutory definition of why POs exist and the which is really an, an effort to minimize the levels of 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 leadership and oversight between a program manager and the ultimate uh, decision authority. 
And just for clarification, the ACAT levels basically represent the amount of money that's tied to a particular program. So obviously the ACAT 1 and 2 are the largest, uh, most expensive programs that are being managed or, or, or uh, led. Uh, so speaking of programs, can you give us a, a quick update of your portfolio? I mean, there's lots going on with that, uh, with that portfolio. I had recently had a conversation with uh, Colonel Tim Howe over at PMAAA, so we got a good insight as to what he's doing over there. But can you touch on, on the programs and where you're at? Yeah, sure. So um, I would say the current, you know, the, the PO's mission is probably, uh, it's kind of significantly morphed over the last, well, really, since I've, since I've been over there uh, as the deputy for the last three plus years, um, really kind of went from a focus on, on vehicles, you know, tactical and combat vehicles uh, with some additional uh, kind of aviation program to really aviation being the focus. And so now we're really, um, and I'll go through the individual programs, but at a top level, we, we kind of have all the, all the systems in, involved in integrated air and missile defense. And, uh, and then in addition, we have the combat vehicle. So, uh, you know, the ACV and, and the LAV family of vehicles. And so I can, and so going back to the, the integrated air missile defense, you know, that's really become a, a focus of the PO so much so that that we've we've really completely redone uh, our our advanced technology group, which was very focused on on automotive and vehicle right, things. Right, right. And now uh, we've through some hiring and some you know moving some folks around, we've much more of a focus on that integrated air missile defense uh, mission. Because frankly, we see that this is really where, this is our primary contribution to the Commandant's goal of greater naval integration of the Marine Corps and the Navy. And, um, you know, with the relatively recent fielding of CEC2S and Gator, uh, the Marine Corps really has something to to offer in that greater uh, IAMD um, mission with the joint, both with the Naval Force, but also the Joint Force. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, can touch on some of those. So if we if we step through some of the programs, you've got uh, inside the air command and control sensor netting PM, uh, you have the Common Aviation Command and Control or CAC2S, which has been fully fielded for the last year or so. Um, their focus of the last couple of years for new capability one has been uh, fielding CC2S to all the amphibs, so what's referred to as CC2S afloat, and that's actually a program that's funded and really managed out of the Navy now, but was born out of uh, an experiment, an opportunity where we, uh, the team, put a, a, a version of CC2S on an amphib just as a, just as an experiment to see if it could support certain things, and it was so beneficial to that uh, ship commander that. Uh, we never got our stuff back. He yeah, just right. <laughs> and um, and convinced the Navy and uh, PO uh, uh, Integrated Weapons System or PW, PO IWS to fund uh, actually properly implementing the cc 2 s capability on all of the big decks, and it really uh, allows them to communicate better with the F thirty five and with the ground forces ashore. So it's been a big uh, a big win all the way around. And, you know, we always like it when somebody else brings money to the table. So that Oh, out. absolutely. I heard a lot of praise for that program. I remember uh, several years ago uh, having some personal knowledge of that. But, yeah, the Marine Corps doing what the Marine Corps is doing. We went out and, and, and built it. We loaned it. And, <laughs> and then we lost it. Right. We made uh, it up. But, it, but it's turned out to be a great story. Yeah, so that's a great success story for the team. And they continue. Um, they'll be, I think, within the next year, filling to the last uh, big deck. Um, meanwhile, the with with you know the force design and the the uh, establishment of the um, MLRs uh, or the ma marine, marine littoral, littoral regiments, regiments right, right. Um, there's a need for a smaller footprint version of CC to us. So from that was born this concept of a small form factor CC to us. So you know right now CC to us is is a couple of uh, on a couple of Humvees. Uh, it'll migrate to a couple of JLTVs at some point. 
Uh, but it's fairly big footprint. Lot, you know, depending on it can be bigger than that, depending on at what level it's being implemented. Right. Uh, you know, lots of lots of computers, lots of screens, big tents, the whole nine yards. You know, to set up a full uh, aviation command and control center. But with in the advent of the MLRs, there's need for a smaller version of CC2S. So. Uh, the team has is moving out on uh, a small form factor version. In fact, we just had a brief today. So uh, they've done the requirements decomposition over the last six months to, you know, how do we how do we give the Marine Corps something uh, that it can use that's smaller, given that we don't have shrink rays just yet. Right. right? So right. <laughs> so how do we get this capability to put it on a ULTV? Uh, you know, and it'll be a fighting pair of ULTVs. But how do we give them the capability, and what do they need? Because obviously, you can't you can't literally have everything that comes to the fight with a full cc 2 s So that's been you know some of the challenge and some of the things we're working with both CD and I and the fleet on is to truly understand that requirement. So uh, the team has done some some great work with Crane, uh, coming up with. A smaller data That's module, Crane, Indiana, the, yep. the Our, naval, the, uh, the warfare center up there, right, right. and uh, and hope to have some of the that initial offering of just the data module out to the fleet later this year. Uh, have uh, somewhere between uh, five and six of them that we can experiment, have the fleet experiment, plug their own uh, radios and monitors and everything into it, so they can start exploring and experimenting with what that that greater footprint can be so that we can fully understand and then integrate those capabilities into a full up, you know, full up a small form factor cc 2 s and, and deliver it in the 2025 timeframe. So that's kind of where that program is going. Um, and, and really those are the focuses of AC2SN. Uh, within the, the Gator program or the ground air task oriented radar, ra radar program, they are in production, they're in fielding, um, you know, dealing with all the, the challenges that you have in early fielding with respect to parts and, right, and right. you know, just inform mortality things. But uh, really doing a good job supporting the fleet and everywhere the Gator has gone, it always impresses and, and uh, fills a gap and in fact, you know, has, uh, has it, giving the Marine Corps just a tremendous amount of capability, you know, two-day mm -hmm. uh, in the fight kind of capability. But the, the Marine Corps, we're not sort of satisfied with that. Uh, there's a lot of work going on to take Gator even further. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. I, I, I understand uh, you're looking to increase the numbers of Gators that you were originally planning to... Uh... Yeah, so there's uh, not so much uh, originally the... the the original AEO uh, was higher because it included the um, air traffic control oh, radars. Oh, gotcha. They gotcha. were never funded gotcha. in the program. Um, so it was it was sort of part of the baseline, part of the original CDD, but never a funded part of the program until potentially now. Um, they okay. are, there is a unfunded, a, an initiative in the unfunded priority list mm -hmm. for an additional number of gators to fill that requirement. We, of course, don't know yet right, if that's right, been right. funded, uh, but that would allow uh, the procurement of an additional set of gators um, to fill that fill that requirement. But in addition, there are other UPLs or right. initiatives in the UPL list that would fund uh, increases in capability for gator that are, are going to be very helpful. And so, you know, we can't get into all of those, but they right. really go after some of the some of the performance, some of the survivability, and just will continue to make Gator a more valuable asset uh, to the Marine Corps. I think, if I may, one of the things that's really fascinating about that radar is that it really replaced five legacy systems into one. Yeah, I mean, so from that standpoint, uh, tremendous value uh, and capability for the Marine Corps. Um, but I think what we're what we're seeing is. As we as we participate in a variety of experiments with other services uh, in that integrated air missile defense sort of family, um, everywhere Gator goes, it impresses. It's interesting. We just did a, a flight test uh, with the Army where Gator served as the sensor, uh, and then working back through the command and control system CC2S, and then the composite tracking network, the antenna or CTN. Uh, connected through back to the Army's uh, fire control capability to 
launch a, a Patriot missile. So wow, that's fascinating. Um, that's awesome. We're really we're really making great strides moving towards the uh, the idea of the joint all domain command and control or the JAD C2. So it's been really exciting, but everywhere we take Gator, its ability to to keep tracks, see targets, um, just wows everybody. And in fact, we we just um, essentially sold a Gator to the Air Force to use it at their test range um, because of uh, they were just so impressed with its capability. So, you know, the Marine Corps, it really just opens a lot of doors for the Marine Corps, quite frankly, That's awesome. in, into these various, uh, these these various forums and um, and it's we just have to something to offer. Yeah, it's great to see that program where it is because, as you know, in a past life of mine, it you know very expensive program and it's often uh, you know frugal service that we are. Uh, we like to be good stewards of taxpayers' dollars, but uh, it's it's challenging if you want the capabilities and the quality. Uh, you're going to have to pay the price, but it's great to see the. Uh, uh, the work that they've done and the achievements that uh, that radar has had. Well, and I think it's it's an interesting, you know, it's interesting you say that because I think that's, you know, certainly Gator isn't unique, right? In right, the fact right. that I think in in all of the programs that have been uh, been game changers, been sort of big leap forward, you know, whether you're talking CEC to us, I mean, it had certainly plenty of challenges uh, as Gator did, as another program we'll talk about in a little <laughs> bit, I think. <laughs> But the reality is uh, that's the nature of, of these advanced tech programs, right? You, you always put a plan together that's sort of uh, success-oriented, and then when the realities of those technical challenges raise themselves, you know, you can't plan for that, so then it just has the perturbations it has. And, and as, we, you know, as we migrate back to this peer threat environment, mm -hmm. um, you know, the idea of these COTS-based programs They've been great, and very successful, and served the needs of the time. But I, I see us moving back into that, uh, you know, more significant development programs. Not maybe immediately today, but as right. we progress, right. you know, you're going to have programs like hypersonic missile programs and these highly technically complex programs that are going to have failures and are going to have challenges. And you know, but the reality is, if you want the great thing that comes out the back end, mm -hmm. like Gator is proving to be. You've kind of got to be willing to put up with uh, some of those things. That's awesome. It's gr great to hear. So, so yeah. So that takes us to the last piece of kind of the aviation side of our world, which is the um, uh, Mattis, uh, which is, or actually I should say the the ground based air defense program program manager who manages the the Mattis program, um, which is the Marine Air Defense Integrated System, and which is really a portfolio of systems that uh, all do counter air, counter UAS capability and uh, using similar technologies, all again, back to a very COTS or if not COTS fully developed, uh, but integrated in such a way to provide a capability either from a mobile standpoint, like L Mattis and what will be Mattis, um, which was the ULTV or the UTV version, which is the light Mattis. Uh, moving to the Mattis, which is the currently the ACAT2 program of record, which will be installed on a JLTV, so a larger capability, more diverse, and gets up into the Group 3, which you've got some fixed and rotary wing as well as the UAS. Um, so you've got the Mattis program, and that's moving out. They have they just went through their milestone B. They're, they're pressing. Uh, they've got a prototype pretty well put together down at uh, NIWIC, mm -hmm. so that's exciting, down at uh, the Warfare Center down there. And uh, again, a diverse portfolio program. They're experimenting with uh, counter UAS as a service for installations, which is pretty exciting. Good opportunity, especially you know when you go to this, all the the sites that need protection. They don't necessarily have, uh, you know, the the air defenders there. Right, they have right. security personnel. Right. So how do we provide that capability without you know trained kind of air defender? So uh, capability as a service is an interesting option there. So they'll continue to, to work again on the Mattis program, the program of record, um, looking for great things there. And then there's another program that they're working that really ties into that integrated air missile defense, which is the medium range intercept capability okay. or MRIC. <clears throat> right now it's a mid-tier acquisition program. It's a prototyping effort, uh, but extremely exciting. We've, we've done a number of tests. We actually finished a, a FireX in December uh, with live fire with a, a variety of, of incoming missiles doing 
essentially different approach angles and whatnot. And in Mattis, even though it's a it's a relatively inexpensive system based on the fact that it uses our Gator, it right. uses our cc 2 s and then we couple that with the relatively inexpensive Israeli missile, the Tamir, which is part of the Iron Dome, and then we use the battle management uh, capability portion of Iron Dome, you can cobble those systems together and, and generate a really impressive capability um, that really have impressed us as we've gone through, you know, the, the Tamir is, is, you know, it's used by Israel in their particular conflict. It's not really being used against high-end threats. But it turns out it has pretty impressive capability, and we continue to learn more about that. So that's what the prototyping efforts to do is to evaluate that, to see how far it can get us with respect to the full, uh, you know, missile defense requirements of the Marine Corps. So more to come. Kind of uh, the whole purpose of that is to gain information for the Marine Corps to make an informed decision here in the next couple of years on where it wants to go. Because obviously, again, when you talk about the peer threat, I mean, missile defense is, is we kind of got out of that business for a while, right? right we right, didn't right. have a true right. threat to worry about. Probably, you know, certainly not in the desert, we didn't. But, but you know, certainly, you know, with uh, China and Russia back on the radar, uh, it's a much bigger problem. So, so it's an exciting program, uh, more to come on that. So it's interesting you talk about GBAT. If I could just uh, make a, a couple of quick, it, it, what you just explained, uh, it kind of goes back to uh, their genetics because they really started doing evaluation of things that what's in the realm of possible with systems that existed and how could we take those systems and make them do the things we need, we need to do, uh, particularly in the counter UAS aspect of it. And now it's grown to... Uh, the missile defense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that whole program office has really done a remarkable job. And they, they actually grew out of the Gator program, interestingly enough. Wow. Um, but, uh, you know, tremendous job of just, like you said, taking what's available and creating right, a capability right. out of it uh, that could be deployed and can can protect Marines. So, um, yeah, that's that you're right. It, you know, that's a place where the Marine Corps has got a tremendous amount of, of capability with very little investment from a development standpoint. Right, so, right. you know, where that, you know, truly integration type programs versus development program, which uh, kind of leads to the vehicle programs, the okay. other two programs. So to start with uh, PM AAA, uh, Advanced Amphibious Assault, who have the ACV and the AAV. As you mentioned, you just talked to Tim Howe, so you got the full, full rundown on, you know, what they're up to. But... Uh, Certainly, you know, everybody understands the AAV has been around a long time. Uh, the challenges with it, obviously, we, we had the, the tragic sinking, uh, you know, a year ago. Um, and so there's, there's that much more emphasis and, and, you know, interest in getting the, the ACVs out there as fast as possible. And so Tim and his, uh, his group were absolutely focused on that. Um, again, just like Gator, dealing with all of the challenges that a new fielding uh, you know, runs into, you know, those initial, hey, you know, this worked great in testing, we give it in the hands of Marines, and all of a sudden, something goes a little sideways. So they're working through all that smartly. And, uh, you know, just recently awarded the lots two through four contract. Mm -hmm. So that was a big milestone. Uh, you know, that will buy out all the personnel variants, and all the command variants, uh, which is which is a big deal. The next two variants, the the gun variant, which is the thirty millimeter gun variant, right, and the right. recovery variant, are in development right now. So they're they're working with BAE on on that development effort. And it uh, so far it's going you know from a the gun variant is going very well. Uh, the testing there, the R variant is is sort of in concept development. We're doing some experimentation with it, but uh, that's that's a little more uh, you know sort of immature, but uh, but moving along to, to meet the timeline. So so that's really, you know, again, as Tim, I'm sure went into greater detail, you know, everything's kind of kind of moving along well. You know, they're, I will say they are um, learning all the joy that comes from moving from a competitive environment to a sole source environment when it comes to contracting, right? So, uh, you know, that program was really well designed. And I think uh, Mr. Garner, you know, gets a, should get a lot of credit for, the way that program was designed and the competition that was built in to that program um, and the way that they got a lot of the production pricing up till now right. was in a competitive right. environment and the Marine Corps certainly benefited from that. So now we're in a sole source environment and we, you have to be, you know, a little bit 
more creative and and figure out how to how to still get uh, the Marine Corps a good deal, you know, um, in a fair return on its investment, but do it in a sole source environment. So they're working through those things. So I got to ask you, I got to take you back in time because, you know, this inevitably was coming. You and I share a, a, a past in a, in a different uh, system, different platform that kind of led up to this. I mean, it's it's no secret. We worked DFE and uh, followed on to MPC and then, you know, to to what it is today. And I know based on my personal experience with you, you had quite a hand uh, in several chapters of this program. So I got to ask you. How does it feel? You're in full rate production. You saw it in its infancy. You saw the, you know, some of the almost successes and some of the failures and, and some of the other systems. But, you know, it's it's come full circle. It's yeah, out there now. Yeah. So, I mean, I, first and foremost, it's it's certainly great to give the Marine Corps and give the, you know, the AM trackers, even if they may be AM truckers now, it's hard to <laughs> hard to know. But it's certainly great to finally give uh, the Marine Corps a new vehicle to replace the, right. the venerable right. AAV, which is which has done an amazing job. But, right. But right. frankly, the... you know, hasn't hasn't you know has its struggles of being relevant on the modern battlefield. Right. Let's let's be honest about that. So look, I won't show my age, but you know, <laughs> if it does as well as I've done, I I don't know. It's it's right. time to move on. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, so from that point, great. But yeah, certainly a little bittersweet um, from a perspective of, you know, short of of coming up with the the actual name amphibious combat right, vehicle, because right. uh, you know I I just didn't think the nav was going to make it happen. <laughs> the new amphibious vehicle, which is what it was what is originally uh, coined. Um, so other than that, um, you know, I, I kind of, I led the program through its original, the ACV program, that is, right, when it was right. still a tracked vehicle. I led that through the the um, uh, MDD milestone and then, uh, you know, went off and did the, the wa high water speed study with Dr. Burrow and then kind of departed the pattern. Right. And it was really after that that, that you know, uh, the program and, and really John Garner and gang kind of plotted a path on how to kind of revive MPC, which had sort of been been kind of killed off briefly. And MPC was the Marine Personnel Yeah, which, uh, which is, looks a lot like an ACV. Correct, correct. <laughs> so they kind of revised that and, and it, it was just, uh, it was the right vehicle for, for, you know, what the Marine Corps needed at the time. Um, but again, and you know, all the credit for that program really goes, you know, Mr. Garner for his visionary to put that program in place that has really executed within months or weeks of what the original plan was. And and you have folks like, you know, Colonel uh, Mullins, uh, who who led as a PDM for ACV right, and right. then as the PM. So he had a long, you know, a big chunk of that where his leadership was critical. Uh, you know, you go back to Angelo Scalardo, was, who was one who was very influential right. in the early phase and kind of a great teammate to Colonel Mullins. Um, and, and all the way back to Mike Olry, who spans back to the NPC time with Mark Paquette, who, again, did a phenomenal job. And it was really the efforts of Mark and Mike who who really did that industry outreach and 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 kind of put the 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 information in place that allowed the Marine Corps to make a decision to go with ACV. So all those folks really, really um, get all the credit for that program. You know, I came along. Uh, in the PEO uh, at a point where, you know, I got to help in the production decisions and certainly, right, right. And, you know, that was great uh, and got to support those folks and, and work with them in a variety of ways. But, uh, but yeah, this is, you know, certainly for anyone that's been laboring, has ever been in AAA over the last 20 years who, you know, feel like we've been trying to replace that darn AV for a long time. It's, it's satisfying, you know, it's, you know, again, at the end of the day, it's not quite as cool uh, <laughs> as the idea of Marines getting the water ski behind right, their, right, their Amtrak. Right, right. Uh, there'll be none of that. But well, I won't tell you where I was in '99 when those decisions initially <laughs> came up. So, but, but yeah, uh, but, uh, but certainly it's a it's a great thing for the Marine Corps, and it's exciting. Awesome. Uh, so, so I guess to transition real quick, transition back to LAV. Absolutely, I was just going to go down that road. I know you inherited the, that program uh, here, what, uh, six or so months well, ago, six, yeah, eight months ago? It's been a little bit more than a year a ago, longer. I think, now. Yeah. And, and it moved over really, uh, obviously, there's the legacy LAV, uh, and they and the team up there is doing a great job keeping that. that They're up, up in uh, Detroit, up right? In Detroit, Michigan. Right. 
and they're keeping it up and running. Uh, it's still a it's still a critical asset. And frankly, with the with the tanks out of the formations, mm -hmm. you know, the LEV twenty five that's kind of the only significant caliber weapon the Marine Corps has at the moment. So they're they're still in great uh, great demand. Um, but uh, the reason really that LAV came to the PO is the potential for the advanced reconnaissance vehicle or the ARV. So that's a pre MDAP program. Right now it's actually being run as a, a mid-tier uh, acquisition prototyping effort. And uh, that'll run, we've got two vendors with uh, both its GD and Textron mm -hmm. are building prototypes uh, that will be evaluated. And, and essentially the way I look at it, uh, an AOA was done for the ARV and you know that's sort of the government's uh, you know chance to evaluate the options and the Marine Corps sort of down selected to either a new start vehicle which is what the mid-tier prototyping effort is looking at or a variant of the ACV and so we have a separate study going on in parallel to the mid-tier uh, acquisition effort to to explore what that might look like and what that might cost and all of that is being done for a Marine Corps decision in 23 okay. to decide what the future of, of really, uh, is there a requirement for a vehicle for, for Marine Corps reconnaissance? And if so, what of these two paths appear to be the most promising and, and you know, then we'll be prepared to step off smartly, whichever of those two and, is and, selected. And that's really what the AOA, the alternative uh, analysis of alternatives will, will eventually help well, I guess what, yeah, to finish that thought, so th there was the AOA, which was the, really the government's attempt to answer the question of oh, what gotcha, the Marine needs. Gotcha. So now the mid-tier is allowing industry to get it, you know, to kind of take their best swing, whether that be BAE in explaining what an ACV version right, might look right. like, or GD or Textron, hey, here's how, this is how close to your requirement we can get with a new start. And so it right. takes it from sort of this analytical approach to more like hardware. We're gonna uh, okay. go be prototypes, we'll get to do a little bit of testing. And so it allows the Marine Corps to make a much more informed decision versus you know, prior to initiating a program of record. So, uh, and, and really we feel like um, that is, you know, that's in many ways what the mid-tier prototyping uh, authorities are really there for, you know, to, to be a, make fully informed decisions before right. you launch into a program. Well, that's great. I mean, it, it seems like uh, you're not only doing great things with fielding, but uh, you've got your hands full uh, just around the corner. And I know you mentioned, you talked a while back about uh, doing a lot of collaboration with the Army and the other services. What are your relationships like? Uh, do, you, do you connect with the other uh, services on a regular basis? Yeah, so on a, on a couple of different levels, uh, yes. Um, First and foremost, we have from a from a you know recurring basis that one of the functions we've we've created an integrated air missile defense cell of sorts uh, within the within the PO. John Stroud kind of leads it. Roy Barnhill is is really kind of the the full time lead, if you will. Uh, and then we, we had a, guy, a gentleman named Jason Elliott who we hired who had 20 years of Aegis experience. We actually just recently deployed him uh, to Gator uh, to help them out. Um, but really with that team, they serve as the Marine Corps rep to a number of, of you know, integrated air missile defense working groups that are either Don level or you know DOD level. And so that keeps us engaged and keeps us talking in, in where we can, you know, add, sort of advertise, if you will, what the Marine Corps bring into the table these days, and uh, that has resulted in, you know, I mentioned the FT6 with the Army, you know, various tests with the Army. We've done uh, tests with the Navy to show how, you know, Navy ships can use the Gator radar um, uh, tracks, you know, through CC2S to um, to engage targets. So. Um, through those bodies, we're we're really sort of advocating to get the Marine Corps' foot in the door in this world, and uh, it's been very successful. So, so those are kind of the recurring basis. Obviously, through a number of these demos, we've worked very closely uh, with PO IWS, both IWS C uh, and then IWS two uh, as well. Are two of the the primary folks within there that we that we collaborate quite a bit with. Um, but we also work with. Um, 
the strategic capabilities office on a variety of things um, to look at innovative ways of implementing some of our capabilities, uh, as well as I mentioned the Army. So uh, PEO, uh, missiles in space, is who primarily we work with in the Army. And, uh, you know, it's, it's all been very successful. I mean, the, the exciting thing is we've done these demos and these experiments. In each case, uh, our stuff is really hit it out of the park. And so we kind of keep getting invited back to more and more. Um, some things, we had a recent one, uh, I, an interest in putting a gator on top of an LCS. We didn't love that idea <laughs> for a number of reasons, especially because I wanted to put it right next to a missile system. <laughs> that seemed all bad. So, uh, but it's great to, to be, you know, it really, we have, um, the most modern radar out there and certainly the most modern radar that isn't, you know, bolted to a ship. So, right. uh, right. so it, it gets us invited to a, a lot of really interesting things. And so it's been exciting. Uh, that's great. Great to hear. I know you mentioned NIWIC, you mentioned Crane and, and a couple others. How important are the, uh, you know, the various research facilities and what, what kind of relationship do you have with some of these DOD research facilities? Well, I think, you know, just like everyone, you know, in the command, we've, the, the research, the, the Navy labs are, are kind of an extension of our technical workforce, right. right, in a lot of places. And and I think certainly in some areas, like if you look at uh, PMAAA, I mean, there's been a relationship with Carterock. In fact, the AAAV program was born out of a project in Carterock, oh, right? And Code yeah. 20 at Carterock right, right. is where it initiated. And uh, that got us the program and Walt Zyphus, for those who remember Walt. Um, <laughs> He He's came a out character of character in his own right, he, so we'll yeah, leave yes. it at that. Right, um, uh. but uh, so you know that's that's a place where we've we've always relied on for that uh, hydrodynamic type uh, support. Um, but I know you know we've also relied on folks like Crane uh, up in Crane, Indiana. Uh, they're kind of the gun experts, so we get a lot of gun expertise, and they've uh, they've also done you know great things for for. Uh, Mattis and uh, and for and they're now as I mentioned small form factor C C two S, so that's another one. And then you you talk about the uh, uh, Nywick. Those guys so it, great capability down <clears throat> down there. And uh, again, I think this command we've gotten a ton of support from from Nywick Atlantic. Um, you know we've got P Ready down there who's always he comes from here. Former so he's PM, in, yeah. Former yeah. PM, former PGD, I believe. Yeah. And so you know Pete's just a great uh, a great resource for us and and always gets us great help and and you know it certainly works to get us the A team which is always very helpful. Um, so yeah, and I and I would say that you know for. Oh, and I, I should mention Dahlgren, too. I, I shouldn't mention Dahlgren because they're, they, you know, first of all, we've been stealing engineers from Dahlgren like crazy <laughs> because that's where all the integrated air missile defense expertise is. I mean, that's and where they close. grow up. You know, they're 40, right down 50 the street. miles down the road. It's, right down the street. Yeah. So it's easy to steal people because yeah, they yeah, just, yeah. you know, commute a different direction. Yeah. Um, and but we also get a lot of uh, tech support from them and, and, and range support. So Dahlgren, Dahlgren's been great. And, and I would say that, um, the labs are going to be even more important to us as we as we look to the future, as we look to more technical programs, as we look to more technical solutions. And, you know, look, we all know that there's a continued downward pressure on our CIV PERS. So as we continue to get work, but we get less money to buy people, right. we're going right. to have to rely on that, that it's, if you want to call it, you know, extended technical workforce more and more. And so I just see the relationships we have with the labs are gonna be more and more critical. And uh, and I could, you know, I could see us doing, doing a, even, you know, get a, even more of a formal relationship the way NAVC had to do it in the late 90s, uh, when they frankly farmed out all their engineers mm -hmm. to the labs and because they, they couldn't sustain the headquarters the numbers at the headquarters. And so we're in that same kind of crunch. So, right. um, so yeah, I think they're critical. I think they're critical well, to it, our success. It's fascinating because uh, you hit on a key point, you know, relationships. Relationships are key to a lot of things that we do. Uh, and I know you've got a, a lot of relationships with our industry partners that, because again, it has to be a partnership to get some of these capabilities to the finish line. What are you looking for from industry in the, in the out years? And what, what should they be paying attention that maybe they're not paying attention to right now? Well, I mean, to a degree, I would say they can expect more of the same. And right. and what do I mean there? So, you know, this this 
sort of fiscally austere environment that, right. that we're in. I mean, we've been in it. We've been in it for a while. And, you know, what that means to industry is uh, industry investment. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the ways that that they're helping us. Programs like the the mid tier prototyping effort for ARV. Right. Right. That's a joint investment. So the vendors are investing their own money with with the government. And I think where where you've got these significant technical programs, um, we're going to need, you know, those those IRAD investments from industry. We're going to need them to be pushing the envelope, to be getting out ahead, to be, you know, one thing that I will I will give Northrop Grumman a lot of credit for is they are always pushing the envelope from a technology standpoint. And they're the uh, the Gator Radar. Yes, well, yeah. and, and a variety of things, but certainly right. Gator Radar, right. F-35. Right. Uh, and so, you know, when, when the need arises, uh, and when we become aware of that need, oftentimes we go talk to Northup. They're already working on something that's that's in the same direction of where our need is, because they're looking out at what the next thing is in, in the technology. Now, it's obviously it's somewhat easier for them because it's very focused on a specific technological area. But um, you know that's the kind of thing we need. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna continue to need. Um, I think also. Uh, more innovative ways on the sustainment side. We're going to continue to need help there. The The cost of sustaining these systems is becoming more and more challenging with less and less money. And so how do we do that in a more economical way? How do they help us do that? You know, right now we, you know, they tend to be the most expensive solution. You know, they're kind of the easy button, you know, right, contractor right. logistics support, but they're also very expensive. And so uh, certainly to the degree that they can, which often forces us away from them and to maybe less optimal sustainment approaches. So to the extent that they can can figure out innovative ways to be cost effective, uh, you know, those things are going to be beneficial. And, and, you know, also just really, I think the other way that, that they're going to need to help us, we're going to need to all help ourselves. And it gets into the, the security side of things. Right. You know that's just become such a, a challenging area with with the the IT and the um, the the sort of chip technology and everything, all the ways in which our adversaries can can attack our systems or all, replicate them. All roads lead to cyber somewhere. Yeah, really do. And so that's just you know, and they're obviously investing in that, but but you know, the the time of us spending all the money developing these capabilities and having our adversaries just steal it from the you know <laughs> yeah. the hard drives yeah. of our contractors or their subcontractors right. is is just that's just eating our lunch we've right. kind of we got to figure that out well, listen rob I, I don't want to take up too much of your time i first and foremost this has been extremely informative and before we get to our what many say is our favorite part of the show i do want to ask you one 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 final question if i could uh, you've obviously spent a few years at uh, at the peo or maybe a few more years at the PEO. Uh, and, and that team has accomplished a lot, but uh, what are some of the things that you're most proud of? I mean, what are some of the things that stand out to you? Uh, and what's on your bucket list that you still want to get done over there at the PEO? Well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, again, the PEO going all the way back to Mr. Taylor, you know, when, when there's that great picture of him at his first staff meeting, which is him sitting at a table by himself. <laughs> I remember um, that photo. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which you know, the PO was sort of established um, over the uh, um, protests of the Marine Corps. Right, the Marine Corps didn't really see a great need for um, for the PO at the time. Um, it didn't maybe understand the role it, it needed to play. But uh, you know, since then, I think through the leadership of Mr. Taylor and then Mr. Garner, um, their the value of the PO, and of course, you know, also. I think there was a recognition of some that the Marine Corps was getting into big programs, right, um, right. some some really important things. And to do that, you really do need to play at the varsity level in some of these programs. And certainly AK-1, as I said, it's it's a statute. Uh, you need a PO to play. And the alternative is put all these big programs on their Navy POs. Um, right. And, you know, there's value to that in some areas. But, you know, what we do is unique. You know, the Marine Corps is not the Navy. The Marine, you know, yes, we want to have greater naval integration, but we're not we're not the Navy. And there's there's just a lot of value in having a Marine Corps PEO, because while the reporting chain is up through the Navy, while the billet is a Navy billet, make no mistake, the PEO land systems 
he recognizes, he answers to the commandant, or he or she, uh, as if you see what the future holds. But um, certainly, this is a Marine Corps organization. Uh, it's manned by Marine Corps employees, by Marine Corps Systems Command employees, uh, who understand the mission, who do what they do every day for Marines. And so, uh, so I think it's it's important when you look at the successes. You know, certainly going all the way back. Uh, uh, you know, the, the truck programs, uh, right, the LVSR, right, the MTVR, right. just the MTVR in particular, just such a great collaboration between CD and I and and kind of bucking the Army and, and delivering just a much better vehicle, frankly, than the Army got or perhaps wanted or no offense afford. to the army but i you know I yeah, like in, I said, in the, conversations where they want our truck now yeah, but, they, yeah. there are t there have been many times in yeah. in you know in afghanistan or iraq where the army asked to borrow right. mtvrs right. they just their trucks just couldn't couldn't do what they needed to do so um you know the the, the truck fleet has been great certainly the the jltv you know since i've been in the po and i think you know when mr garner took over uh, when Stackley really placed him here, he had a mandate. Uh, he had a gauntlet of programs that needed to get over the, the hump mm -hmm. to production, right? Four programs were all sort of lined up at the game. I remember. And, uh, and you know, every one of them, he made it across the finish line. CC2S, uh, the JLTV, the Gator, and then uh, finally the, the ACV. So... I mean, I think that's a tremendous record of accomplishment for the PO, certainly for Mr. Garner, fully fulfilling his mandate. Every one of those programs got across that line either on schedule or ahead of schedule. CC2S was nearly a year ahead of schedule. Um, the Gator, uh, similarly, uh, not as much ahead of schedule, but slightly ahead of schedule. So, um, so that I think is, you know, because at the end of the day, it's what we all do, right? Why we're all here is to get gear in the hands of Marines, right? And so those were... And, you know, in the last uh, three plus years, four years with Ms. for Mr. Garner, you know, four programs get you know getting capability, you know, in incredibly needed, vital capability into the hands of Marines. So, I think that's you know that's great. I think the fact that uh, we're using the MTA authorities on a couple of programs, you know, up with our friends up at uh, LAV are doing right. just great right. things with that. Uh, you know, our Mattis program. Um, certainly, I think the uh, you know with the with the MREC, but uh, I think the the Maddox folks are just really have to be commended for with with little money with no program of record they just put a, a tremendous amount of counter UAS capability out there in the hands of Marines, you know most famously uh, you know highlighted by President Trump when they <laughs> uh, when they shot down a couple of uh, or the the Marines put you know the the actual ship commander put the Mattis up right, on, on his, his deck, on going, the flight deck yeah. going, uh, yeah. going past Iran and they shot down a couple of Iranian uh, U.S. So, so, you know, a lot of success stories, um, you know, as we say, you know, the motto is it's all about the warfighter. So I think the most important things are when we get capability in the, in the hands of the warfighter. So, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of what I would point to. Well, that's great. Again, uh, I think this has been really insightful and I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to join us here today. Uh, before we let you go, we got a, a challenging part of this, uh, uh, this, uh, this effort here. I do have to ask you some difficult questions. Right, lightning round. So if you're ready, let's jump right into our lightning round. All right. Uh, what's your favorite vacation spot? Uh, I'll go with uh, Sandbridge. It's down near Virginia Breach. That's where oh, our okay. family and uh, friends, we, we've been vacationing for the last several years. And it's got a little bit of everything for everybody, so uh, we've really enjoyed it. I've that's gone to more awesome. exotic spots, but yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. But that's it's just, just like yeah. it's like comfort food. It's just easy to get to. That's have awesome. a good time. So, that's well, yeah, that's and spot. spending a lot of time on ninety five, I can see. Yeah, uh, we, we avoid it. <laughs> uh, so I got to ask you, what's a TV show, book, or movie, uh, or or a podcast? I'm gonna go podcast. Recommend? You're gonna go podcast. I'm gonna go podcast. So oh. so I'm gonna recommend. Uh, how did this get made? Oh, okay. It's pretty funny. They basically um, uh, talk about movies that are terrible. And so it's how did this get made? And they just go through it and they take a very, they sort of uh, revel in the greatness of how bad it was. So, uh, but it's a, it's pretty, pretty funny. It's a couple of the guys from the, the show, The League. Oh, okay. Uh, and they're just, it's just a funny show. They have guests and whatnot. So I'll recommend that.
It's a little uh, off to be. I'm about. surprised. I thought you were going to go movies because I know you're a bit of movie buff. Am, and but, uh, but we'll you know we'll, in the we'll, pandemic we'll movies it. are kind of hard to come by. I've been waiting for you know Maverick for four years. Uh, I like, so I, you know. So uh, if if you weren't doing what you're doing now, what would Rob Cross be doing? Yeah, who knows? I, I guess uh, <laughs> if not for a hiring freeze at the time, I probably before I got the job at Carter Rock, I. Um, was essentially selected for a position at the Savannah River Project oh. down in Aiken, South Carolina. So I'd be, oh. I would have been working on nukes this whole time, oh. and I would be glowing at this point, presumably. <laughs> uh, and maybe I would have had those some of those superpowers you're about to ask me about. I, I, I am. You, you knew exactly where I was going. So a uh, little green man and everything. So if you had a superpower, what would it be? Yeah, so... Um, Strangely enough, I so I thought about a couple things, but I think it's going to be luck. I'm going to go to du- you know, luck. There, was, luck. there was an argument, you know, in the Deadpool two back to uh, movies. Uh, I reference the movie. Yeah. So in Deadpool two, the character Domino has a bit of an argument with Deadpool that her superpower is luck. He's like, that's not a superpower. She's like, yeah, it is. No, it isn't. So, but it turns out her luck pretty much carries the day. So, I'm going to go with luck because I because you know flying is going to get old. Right. And it's very right, solitary. Right, right, you can't right. really share it with anybody. Yeah. Super strength, you're yeah. just going to be carrying everybody's couches. I did the whole invisibility thing. That doesn't work anymore. Yeah, invisibility is no good, right? That's boring. <laughs> so you can just spy on people. Yeah. So, you know, these are all, they're all kind of a burden. But, you know, luck, it's just good things are going to keep happening ah, to you, right? So, there you go. There you and, go. And, you know, so I'm going to go with luck. Yeah. Well, listen, that's awesome. Again, uh, thanks for taking the time to join us. Best of luck in the future. Maybe we'll get you back here at another day. Who knows? All right. Who knows what the future holds? Well, this concludes another episode of Equipping the Core. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation today. If so, please take a couple minutes, leave us a review, subscribe, tell your friends about us. Till next time, Manny Pacheco signing off.